welcome to our uh, annual John Doris Lecture. And I'm John Eckenrode. I'm the director of the Bronfenbrenner Center for Translational Research. And it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce our speaker to you today, uh, Professor Larry Aber. Uh, I want, first of all, I wanted to thank you all for coming today. And I wanted to thank uh, everyone who had something to do with organizing this, especially Patty Thayer, who's in the back of the room here, who did all the logistical arrangements. Okay. Now, there's none of the Doris children here, is there? Nobody that I can see? I thought Joan maybe was coming. Um, so um, let me tell you a little bit about Larry. Um, he, I'm going to have to read some of this because it's such a long, I don't know how you'd fit all this on a business card, but uh, I'll, I'll read your title, which is the Albert and Blanche Wilner Family Professor of Psychology and Public Policy at the Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Development. <gasps> and <laughs> university professor, NYU, where he's also the board chair at the Institute of Human Development and Social Change. He's also board chair for the Children's Institute for the University of South Africa. Uh, he's, and he also formally directed, um, some of you may know him from a prior life as the uh, director of the National Center for Children in Poverty when he was at Columbia. Uh, Larry received his uh, bachelor's from Harvard and his PhD from Yale in clinical community and developmental psychology. And he's been a really incredibly prolific uh, researcher and scholar, having made significant contributions to many areas of research, including the social and emotional development of children, uh, sp especially around issues of conduct disorder, aggression, and mental health, uh, the development, uh, developmental impact of child maltreatment, the effects of poverty, of course. Uh, he's done a fair amount of work on the role of neighborhoods as a context for development. And uh, it's been very active in, uh, in exploring developmental approaches to the design and evaluation of preventive interventions, some of which we'll hear about today. And it's been very active on the policy side, They're doing policy research on, on child and family services. His research has been uh, amply supported by federal agencies, NIMH, NICHD, University of Department of Education. Uh, he's also received funding from the, from the Gates Foundation and the U.S. Agency for International Development, which I believe supported some of the work you'll talk about today, among others. He often consults with scientific bodies and NGOs and government agencies. Uh, we're very pleased he could be with us here today to present some of his recent and current work on school-based interventions in both the U.S. and in Africa. And we also hope to be the beneficiaries of his wise counsel and expert consultation as we strive in the center to bring research to practice and policy community. So please join me in welcoming Larry Aber to Cornell. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, I don't have a business card. <laughs> I'm a practical person. There's too many words in that. It is such a pleasure to be here. Uh, and um, I was telling colleagues last night over dinner that uh, Yuri Bronfenbrenner uh, uh, was an animating figure in my own life in many, many, many ways. And I'll just touch on a few of those today. Um, but. Uh, I have to begin with my first memory of seeing and hearing Yuri, and it was, how many of you are in your second year of graduate school? Uh, hi. <laughs> um, uh, uh, when I was at your stage in, in graduate school, Yuri, uh, which was in the mid-70s, I'm afraid to say, uh, uh, Yuri was invited to give a colloquium at Yale uh, by my mentor in graduate school, Ed Ziegler, who Ed Ziegler thinks he started Head Start. Apparently, you guys think Yuri started Head Start. I think Head Start is one of those multiple paternity uh, uh, and probably maternity cases. Um, and uh, the hair stood up on the back of my neck when he was talking about the ideas he had uh, that he later uh, expressed fully in the ecology of human development. So um, since that time, uh, I've been very, very uh, influenced by him. And I, I think you'll see that today. Um, now, let's see. Advancing might be really as simple as that it is. Um, so uh, 
behind all those various activities that John described, there have been really two overarching concerns. Most of us who, who get old in this field, we only have a couple of things that are on our mind most of our life. <laughs> and and uh, there have been two things on my mind most of my professional life. How do poverty and violence at multiple levels affect uh, children and their families? And how can public policies and social programs either reduce children's exposure to poverty and violence or alternatively buffer uh, children from their toxic effects. There are many instantiations of that over the course of my work, but I, I do want to um, say it's really education policy and interventions and anti-poverty policy and interventions uh, that have been, I, I think, the enduring strands of my work. And someday I want to wake up and not read something like this. You know, we spend trillions of dollars putting policies and practices into place, but most of these efforts are based on the crudest possible psychological guesswork says our, um, the, the Republican Democrats love to love uh, uh, David Brooks. Um, and I think he's right, but uh, that's depressing. And, uh, and I, I hope we can change that. Uh, over the course of my time in thinking about all these things, there have been two towering figures. I don't have to talk to you about Yuri. Um, but I do want to emphasize that his, his notion of embedded ecologies um, really had enormous theoretical richness. Uh, his notion of how those change over real time, you know, person, process, context, time, dynamic was very important. But it, it's, we're only now beginning to develop the empirical and statistical tools to actually test theories that, uh, and, and use frameworks that, that uh, Yuri brought to bear. Um, so uh, multi-level modeling, um, before it was usable by people like me, uh, it was usable by only a small number of people who didn't care about human ecology. They cared about something else. Um, and understanding uh, things in a multi-level dynamic way is enormously important. The other enormous figure uh, that I didn't really appreciate affected me as much as he did until much later, like literally in the last couple of years, was Donald Campbell. How many young people know who Donald Campbell is here? Uh, two or three. But uh, um, so uh, he was probably the previous generation's greatest methodologist in a certain way. The book, Experimental and Quasi-Experimental Designs for Research, we more or less had to memorize uh, in, in uh, graduate school as part of our initial methods courses. And, um, but he really championed, he was a very early champion of randomized field trials as ways of, of bringing knowledge to, to the betterment of society. And over the course of his life, he began increasingly articulating a vision for the experimenting society. I'm not going to have enough time to go into that much. Uh, um, I prepared about an hour and 10 minutes worth of material that I will deliver in 40 minutes. So, um, the, uh, um, but I'd be happy to talk about it more. Um, I, I do want to begin with a quote of his. In, in the social sciences, including economics, we're scientific by intention and effort, but not yet by achievement. We have no elegantly successful theories that predict precisely in widely different settings, nor do we have the capacity to make definite choices among competing theories. Even if we had, the social settings of ameliorative programs involve so many complexities that the guesses of the experienced administrator and politician are apt to be, on average, as wise as those of the social scientist. So my first two quotes, I hope, depressed you as thoroughly as, as they have me. Um, Donald began thinking this in the 70s. Uh, this quote is from a, a, a posthumous collection of essays in his honor, um, uh, published in 1998. But uh, I think we're still pretty close to this situation as well. We may be on the cusp of something new, but uh, um, uh, we're, it's been a long time that we hoped for something different. Um, there's going to be a thousand things that help us move along if, if, if we're going to move along. I personally have become quite uh, preoccupied with the notion of settings as a way 
of helping us move things along. Uh, uh, Don used the, 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 the concept of settings in thinking about uh, ameliorative programs as social settings. Um, uh, Bronf and Brennerins uh, are, you know, uh, it's easy to think of a setting as a micro context. Um, the, the many people in the, you know, there's about six of us who really know what a micro context is. And if we say that word to regular humans, uh, they don't get it. So, so settings is as close as I've gotten to a common term for it. I, I would love somebody to invent a more uh, effective way of communicating. But they are micro contexts. They're above the level of individuals and their systems. And uh, for me, a good working definition is that's where children and youth live and transact via the kind of proximal processes that uh, Yuri talked about. And they include all these kinds of things. And um, I think we, one way of advancing is to improve theory, measurement, conceptualization, and intervention strategies around settings. Settings as the unit of analysis, as the unit of intervention. And that looking at the characteristics of settings across these types of settings, uh, how resources high and low, coherence high and low, heterogeneity of, of membership high and low, there are, there are there's the potential for abstracted knowledge across settings that we have not begun to realize because we work in fairly siloed ways on these settings. And, and uh, I think that one way we're going to need to advance is to move beyond that. Why focus on settings? For the same reason Willie Sutton robbed banks. Uh, he robbed banks because that's where the money is. I focus on settings because that's where the kids are. They don't walk around uh, all by themselves usually. And, uh, but also because of the very long history of, of failures and attempts to change children without changing settings. There's also a pretty long history of changing settings without changing children that hasn't gone so well either. And I'm pretty sure we need to do both if we want to uh, move things forward. So I'm going to give you a blistering Manhattan minute version of two lines of work. Um, because I want time to reflect on it. And these lines of work, if you're more interested in the details of them, are going you know, have been and are going to be published in more detail, so you can follow them up. But um, I'm going to focus on field experiments in Don's uh, terms that try to improve children's academic learning and their social-emotional learning and mental health via changing schools and the settings within schools that include classrooms. And I'm going to uh, do that um, with the obsessions of the intervention scientist in mind. Uh, so intervention scientists are obsessed by uh, many things, but four big ones. Uh, causal inference, you know, does the damn thing work? Internal validity. Um, deterministic, unidirectional isn't, uh, if I don't think the kind of causal inference we're talking about. It's mostly probabilistic and bidirectional, which uh, screws with your concept of causality, but it, that's where it is. Theories of change, how does it work? And uh, how intervention design and implementation mesh with concepts of the mechanisms of action, and I think the mechanisms of action are incredibly important. Um, and uh, do interventions have, like the one we were talking about this morning, if that intervention uh, doesn't change substance use behavior, I'd eat my hat. I mean, if it changes, uh, uh, risky sexual behavior, if it doesn't uh, also change substance use behavior, I'd eat my hat, uh, but multiple outcomes. Uh, the third obsession of an intervention scientist is heterogeneity of impact, you know, for whom, under what conditions. And some people talk about that primarily in terms of variations of quality and fidelity of implementation. Um, that's important, but variations due to subpopulations and contexts are also in enormously and almost transcendently important. And then uh, the last biggie, and, uh, and this is the one that, uh, as Rachel and I were talking about a little bit on the walk over, really butts up against policy, you know. Uh, will it work again? You know, generalizability, external validity. What if it's done again? What if it's done somewhere else? What if it's done with other populations? What if it's done in a more sustainable way? Will it work? And the relationship between interventions and systems and policies I think is uh, um, enormously important. So with those obsessions, here's the Manhattan Minute of two projects. Um, I'm going to describe a, a school-based intervention in New York City, the four R's, 
uh, a, a one with similar goals in a very different part of the world, the opportunities for equitable access to quality basic education in the eastern provinces of the Congo. And I'm going to do that fast enough that I have at least five or ten minutes to discuss lessons and next steps. So with my apologies. Um, none of this kind of work it can be done without uh, collaborators, funders, and a history. Um, I, I've taken a right in histories because they evaporate. Uh, and um, uh, uh, the history of a research practice partnership that is now existed about 20 years in New York City, um, I could spend the rest of the afternoon telling you just about the history of that collaboration. Um, but there's all sorts of things behind any of this kind of work. We, we all know that. Um, and it includes uh, prior work. So uh, I've been invo involved in uh, evaluating the, the four R's program, which stands for Reading, Writing, Respect, and Resolution. And I'll tell you more about it in a second. Tr in a true experimental way, after about six or seven years of studying um, a predecessor to that program quasi-experimentally. So, you know, doing it the old-fashioned way, you know. You understand the developmental phenomenon, its contextual variation, you develop measures of those things and pilot them, you uh, develop an intervention and, and or another person develops an intervention and you evaluate it quasi-experimentally and then you test it experimentally. And so the four R's work that I'm describing is now the result of about 20 years of work. But it's not in the biggest meta-analysis of social emotional learning programs, DERLAX, because it's the 4Rs program was published after, uh, the, after this. And I want to come back to DERLAC. But there's, there's intellectual and programmatic background and context besides collaborators, funders, and history. Um, why social emotional learning? The, the skills are universal. They're developmental. They're essential to how kids do in school. Uh, and undoubtedly, our lack of attention to Social emotional learning uh, creates a glass ceiling in how kids can achieve in schools. For me, principals and superintendents say, why focus on social emotional, why, why have a curriculum in social emotional learning? I said, you have one. The question is whether it's unintentional, not evidence-based, and you can't reflect on it, or whether it's intentional, evidence-based, and you can reflect on it. You have a social emotional curriculum. Uh, it, uh, every school does. And uh, so programs that intentionally target uh, both social emotional learning and academic intervention I think are enormously important. No social emotional learning uh, intervention that I know of addresses every key social emotional domain. There's too damn many of them. Uh, social competence, emotional competence, cognitive regulation, you know, 15 years ago, people didn't talk about emotional competence or cognitive regulation. It was all social competence, okay? Uh, but slowly, we built out the domains of social emotional learning and skills. My young colleague, Stephanie Jones at Harvard, has done a wonderful job developing a way of coding social emotional interventions for targeting the processes that they, that they, uh, they look at. So, uh, so it's a family of interventions. And I'm going to describe this classroom-based social-emotional learning intervention called the 4Rs very briefly. It's a universal school-based intervention. It combines social-emotional learning strategies uh, into a, a high-quality literacy development program. So one of the things we learned is don't make it a freestanding program. It takes too much time. It costs too much money. Principals don't see it as mission-driven. Pay the marginal costs of doing it, not the full costs by integrating it with literacy, math, social studies. Uh, um, there's seven uh, unit literacy-based curriculum that includes uh, children's literature that is filled with social emotional themes. They learn to read on the books, and then you only pay them more. They already know the books from learning to read. What it takes to, to do the social emotional learning lessons are tiny, because they've already covered the content in a certain way from the books. You train teachers and you do ongoing coaching, one-off training, uh, dead, shoot it, uh, don't ever do it, you're wasting money. Uh, some combination of coaching and enduring, uh, training and enduring coaching. Uh, co some form of coaching is necessary for these kinds of changes. And uh, Tom Roderick at that website, uh, there's a big, uh, the, the entire intervention is laid out in exquisite detail on, on the website of Morningside Center for Social Organization. 
we came along um, and we had been doing this work with them and uh, tried to develop, uh, we, we normally proceed by trying to understand interventionists' implicit theories of change and making them explicit and querying them with evidence and, uh, from other theory and practice. So we, we don't uh, dream up interventions. We work with interventionists who, so for instance, the Resolving Conflict Creatively program was in nine states in 250 schools serving hundreds of thousands of kids before it was evaluated. So you didn't have to wonder about whether it was going to scale. It, it, was, it had already been scaled, but we didn't know about its efficacy. Uh, that's the backwards way of the prevention pyramid, okay? But we need to do that too. They already solved the engineering and marketing problems of getting a lot of people to buy it. And so, but then they got, and I said when we were doing the quasi-experimental evaluation, we can study it quasi-experimentally, but in the end we're not gonna know whether it's the teachers or the uh, intervention. He said, that's okay. Then we did it, and, and we kept writing. It, it, uh, uh, kids being in these classrooms do better, but we don't know it's because the teachers who took up the program more, or it's the intervention that they took up more. He said, we don't, what do you mean? Th then we don't, we're not in this uh, gold standard. And I said, yeah, that's right. So that's why we did the 4-hour study. And the 4-hour studies began saying, if you change these teacher skills and management, it's going to affect kids' literacy and, and, and social-emotional skills. And that will lead to these dual outcomes. And of course, in a randomized trial, you can only test easily the direct effects. So the red arrows are the direct effects, but the theory is a mediated effect. And we immediately knew that was too simple. Um, uh, and, I mean, way, way, way too simple, and, um, but at least it was uh, um, beginning to realize Kurt Lewin's famous phrase, there's nothing so practical as a good theory. So we had a little bit of a theory work in here, but um, Einstein had a thing or two to say about theory, too, and one of the things he said was, a scientific theory should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. And so, the first one did not really recognize the embedded multi-level nature of the intervention. And the second one very explicitly does. It says that there are school culture and climate that affects the classroom system. And the classroom system is, uh, has many parts. The four we focused on are teacher affective and pedagogical processes and practices when Sister Rosemary punched me in the nose and loosened my tooth in seventh grade. I told that story last night. Um, she had a, a pedagogical process uh, that she was working on there. It didn't affect my relationship with her. Uh, I was expelled for hitting her. Um, um, and I'll admit that I was probably disposed toward uh, uh, hitting her. So um, the, um, but these kinds of things go on and they affect the classroom emotional uh, instructional and organizational climate and those things in, in turn affect this. Again, you, you, uh, some of these red lines, uh, you notice that I'm putting a red line in here. It's uh, causal mediation and, and, and you can test uh, mediational processes causally, so we'll get there. So those are the ideas. How do you test this three-year, six-wave longitudinal experiment? It's a whole school intervention, but for evaluation purposes, we only follow the third grade cohort, third, fourth, and fifth grade. We've now followed them out of those elementary schools into middle schools and high schools. I have no data on that. We're collecting it as we speak. Um, the schools were matched and uh, on a, a 20 vector, uh, 20 variable vector, and then randomized to treatment and control, so we had matched pairs. The advantage of that is if one of your pairs drops out, you don't break the experiment. You drop the pair, you reduce power, but you still have the experiment. Uh, all, uh, and the schools were representative of the 75 or 80 percent of the schools uh, in, in the middle of the distribution of New York schools. It wasn't the very best, and it wasn't the ones where cops were there all the time. It was, it was, it was schools in the middle. Um, uh, primarily white, uh, uh, primarily Hispanic and black, very small percentage of whites, a large number of kids who identified as mixed race and Asian, about half below the poverty line. Um, tons of measures. I'm going to really focus on 
Uh, three sets of measures, the social emotional skills and behaviors that uh, were thought to be changed, the academic achievement of the kids, and school culture and climate. That in reverse order. And these are the main effects that we published so far, uh, the main results of the 4Rs program. For the first question, what are the main effects of the program on the classroom processes and the child level social, emotional, and academic pro uh, outcomes? Um, most of you probably know the class instrument by Bob Pianta. It's a classroom observational instrument, 10 dimensions of behaviorally anchored ratings. And uh, 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 those 10 uh, dimensions sum up into three uh, super dimensions, emotional, instructional, and organizational support. After one year of uh, participation in the 4Rs programs, ratings on, on classroom climate, uh, the cl overall classroom quality scores uh, by independent blind raters, um, about a 0.7 effect size on classroom quality, um, mostly attributable to uh, instructional support improvement, even though it was a social emotional learning intervention, but also emotional support. There's a star there, sorry, I'm uh, a little dyslexic. And, uh, but not the organizational and behavior management part of, of the classroom quality. So um, this was very good news to, to, um, to be able to uh, improve a setting in a year's time in that way. Uh, and, um, and it gave us the feeling that perhaps the downstream theor theorized outcomes would, would come on board. There are, uh, there are 11 uh, primary processes and outcomes that we looked at. We, had, we have data on 40 or 50. But a priori, we said these are the, these are the 11 that we're looking at, uh, at for our main results. Three of five child reported outcomes, uh, we got significant impacts on kids' hostile attribution bias. Uh, their self, which was done using a hypothetical vignettes uh, measure. Child self-report of depression and, and aggressive strategies used in problem solving. Three of four teacher reported outcomes, aggression, uh, 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 ADHD, and social competence is positive. That went up. Everything else went, well, went down. Uh, the effect sizes are small, about 0.2, but they're small about a lot of things that make a fair amount of coherent sense. No simple main effects for, out, for academic outcomes uh, through year two. So there was no average treatment control differences in their reading and math scores. But, uh, well, so I'm just going to give you a little sense of what we're doing is, when we did this 15 years ago, one of the first things we reported is kids develop more hostile attribution bias over the course of elementary school. That really depressed, I'm, I guess I'm in a depressive mood today, that, that really depressed the interventionists and the principals uh, and teachers who we were feeding back on. The normal path in hostile attribution bias in New York City schools from first grade to sixth grade, uh, our earlier studies showed, was the kind of line you see in the, and these are residuals controlling for everything else. So th that control line is, uh, is removing the variance associated with SES, with gender, with a bunch of other things. That's why it's, if, if it was, if the uh, uh, unconditional model of hostile attribution bias uh, looks a lot steeper. Um, but you see that intervention deflects you from that growth. It doesn't actually reduce it. It just stops the growth of it. Um, and um, that was observable over all four waves of, of uh, data um, over the first two years. But aggressive strategies uh, didn't really begin to, this is a significant effect, but um, the intervention group didn't actually begin reporting lower levels of aggressive strategies until into the second year of the intervention. So there was a lagged effect on aggressive strategies. These are the kinds of uh, simple growth curves that are the outcomes for those major tests. I reported that there was no main effect for academic skills, but uh, uh, another a priori hypothesis was it was going to be the most behaviorally disruptive kids uh, at baseline who would most benefit from this setting level intervention. Even though they, it was a universal trial, we felt that it, they would get skills they weren't getting differentially more, but equally important, peers would become more skilled at dealing with aggressive kids. And that those two things combined 
uh, would make it possible for kids at, at higher behavioral risk to, to benefit academically from the intervention. So we have uh, three groups of kids rated at baseline behavioral risk, which is acting out, aggression, uh, uh, externalizing behavior, three or four indices like that. Uh, the blue bars are no risk, the red, uh, moderate risk, and the green, uh, the top 8% in behavioral risk, to, uh, almost two standard deviations, uh, the highest groups of kids. And you see that um, for math achievement score te tests, high stakes state tests, and for teacher reported academic skills, the pattern is identical, and uh, the highest risk kids uh, uh, score uh, as high as their no risk uh, and moderate risk classmates after two years of treatment. So this is a intervention by baseline risk interaction that is obscured by the main effect because it's only true of the bottom 8%. Um, so these are the kinds of things we've found through the second year of the intervention where uh, my colleague Steph Jones is going to be reporting some third year results at SRCD. Uh, uh, sorry to tell you that um, things look like they're backing up a little. And there's, uh, so uh, we had hypothesized cumulative uh, improvement over time, and we're seeing some slide back after year two uh, um, into year three, um, with the possible exception of depression, uh, which uh, seems to be actually uh, uh, continuing to improve. Little evidence for anything else. Uh, we'll, have, we'll have more to say about that later. Two final things um, about four R's. The first is um, it's nice to know that f there's an experimental effect on the setting level. It's nice to know that there's an experimental effect on social emotional processes like hostile attribution and outcomes like aggression. But the theory says it's the change in the setting that leads to the change. So we've been developing ways of using instrumental variable techniques. Uh, Pamela Morris, who, I, who is here in the fall, is teaching uh, me how to use, and Steph Jones, how to use instrumental variable test needs to, to test causal mediation. And through year two, there is, a, there is evidence that the, the changes in classroom climate achieved at year one causally uh, mediate, uh, causally lead to the improvements in hostile bias and aggression. And that makes, in my uh, opinion, classroom client more actionable, okay? It's not epiphenomenal. It's not uh, a correlate. It's a causal mechanism. Now, we, we haven't proved that. We're, uh, there's going to be several other studies in independent samples testing it. But this is what I meant by uh, mechanisms of action. We don't want to use just correlational data because we want to point a bazooka at this stuff, and we don't want to point a bazooka at this stuff unless when you change it, it changes the ultimate outcomes that you want. So that's the science, that's the, the policy and program stake behind the science of causal mediation. And finally, uh, um, the idea that all of this affects all kids equally is unlikely. We already had these baseline risk interaction results. Um, with everything we're learning about the genetics of dispositions towards sensitivity to the environment, uh, our young colleague Josh Brown has developed um, a set of theories that say, you know what, we, we get positive effects of four R's on aggression, on depression, and on ADHD. We don't get it on substance use yet because we haven't even measured it. We'll, we'll see. But there are known genotypes that the literature says when you face risk, um, the probability, if you have the low activity MAOA genotype, the short allele 5-HTT uh, uh, genotype, the 7-repeat DRD4 genotype, when exposed to risk, you're, you increase the likelihood of negative outcome. So following uh, several people like Belsky, why wouldn't that increase your responsivity to positive uh, environments as well? And there's a lot of correlational data that says it's not a risk allele. It's a differential susceptibility to setting level environmental influence allele. It's, uh, and, and that means that they should be differentially responsive to positive environments, which we're experimentally inducing. So 
uh, Josh uh, is in the middle of, of this very interesting work, which really leads us to Yuri's vision. Back to Yuri's vision. A biopsychosociology of uh, human development. And um, I'm very interested in, in uh, reversing these false dichotomies of, of neuroscience and biology and intervention science and policy. Those, those aren't helpful. Okay. Um, now, that's one study. It's a study that's built on 15 years of work. Durlach and his colleagues meta-analyzed 200 studies over 20 years involving 20, 200,000 kids in uh, 2011. And half of all social emotional learning interventions, all of them school-based, not all of them school randomized or classroom randomized, but some of them individual randomized. Half of them true experiments, half of them quasi-experiments. And our findings are roughly consistent with uh, uh, his findings that average impacts across studies on the kinds of social emotional processes targeted like hostile bias are above 0.5. Um, the social emotional outcomes like depression and aggression 0.2 to 0.25. And, and this is the hidden news, academic outcomes, average impacts, 0.27. Social emotional learning is the most sustained, effective, diverse intervention strategy to improve reading and math that we have. There is no dimension of school reform that has had as many replications of ability to change achievement as social emotional learning. So we're trying to drive that truck into the Department of Education and unload it. So um, now the reason I'm saying that is to give you a sense of the level of effort of any individual study and how it has to add up into rep replications and systematic reviews and meta-analyses, begin to get a sense of where the science is that, that can more powerfully lead to policy and practice change. But it also really emphasizes what Jim Kim, the new president of the World Bank, says he wants the World Bank to specialize in now, which is the science of delivery. And the biggest important part of the Durlach meta-analysis, for those of you that didn't see it, is that they blind-coded the interventions on four dimensions. Do they involve sequenced activities? Are, do they require active engagement by the children? Are they focused? And are they explicit? what they call safe. You independently code them, all of the effect comes from safe interventions. Uh, those double the impact and the unsafe, the not sequenced, not active, not focused, not explicit, zero impact. So it's not just what you do, it's how you do it. And so the, so, um, now I spent the most time describing four R's because this is as good a science as I can do. Uh, that doesn't mean it's, it's, it's very far from the best science that can be done, but this is about as far as I've gotten. Um, I aspire to do that in other parts of the world now. And uh, I think our field needs to as aspire to do that. This is, in my opinion, the single most important social science graph in the world. And it is the relationship of national uh, per capita income, which is on the x-axis, uh, it's a log scale, and life expectancy, average national life expectancy on the y-axis. And uh, the uh, countries up there in the corner are us, okay? The, the big green bubble in the top right-hand corner is the U.S. of A. Um, and you'll see that in our collection of countries, we're off diagonal. We have much lower life expectancy than our, our average GDP would predict. But all of them are way on that. That's just noise against the world, okay? And uh, you see that India, and if um, on gapminder.org, there are pictures of these animated over the centuries. They get more and more accurate with more and more countries over the most recent decades. But you can see the, uh, the world began here 200 years ago, and boy, uh, does it move over, over time. So can anybody uh, tell me where to point to the worst place in the world to live right now? Where is it on the graph? Down here, right there. Those of you who are close enough, can you read it? 
Democratic Republic of Congo. So the alpha and the omega of the world. Uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo used to be called Zaire. Before that, the Belgian Congo. Um, uh, the Eastern Congo is uh, where um, Tutsis who overthrew Hutu, who were committing genocide on Tutsis in Rwanda, drove the Tutsis into the Eastern Congo. And it's had 25 years of sporadic uh, war. Um, uh, it is the epicenter of what historians call Africa's world war. Uh, that has involved about eight uh, African countries with incursions into each other, primarily into the Congo. And about six million people, uh, between five and six million people have died in, in Central Africa since um, the late 80s, early 90s. Most of them by fleeing from massacre and dying of disease or starvation while fleeing. Not most of them macheted to death, although those are the most, but fear of being macheted to death drove them uh, into places where, so uh, I won't describe OPEC in great detail now. There's stuff on our website about it, but we're trying to do similar work to four R's in the Congo. Uh, it's a collaboration between the International Rescue Committee, the Ministry of Education in Congo, uh, funded by different funders. Uh, and the goals are similar. We want to improve teacher performance and student uh, academic and social emotional outcomes. Um, and USAID funded IRC to work with 350 schools and a half a million kids uh, over a five year period to basically uh, implement a curriculum that integrates SEL into reading and math, if that sounds familiar, and to evaluating using a cluster randomized trial, if that sounds familiar. The theory of change uh, is a lot more built out around the policy parts. Um, this is all policy. <laughs> um, and the, the thing that's randomly assigned is master teachers and cluster learning centers to do the kinds of things that uh, we were describing elsewhere. Um, and these double he uh, lined arrows are the theory of change uh, for the randomized part of basically training and coaching through indigenous teacher circles. The, the, in Congo, they use teacher circles, uh, weekly and monthly teacher circles as the main form of professional development. Um, the questions are the same. Uh, and there are other objectives to the intervention besides uh, the impact evaluation itself, which is to learn how to do this in rotten places in the world. And, uh, and the, the design is even more complicated, but it's basically a weightless randomized control where uh, there are, we're working in six educational provinces and there are three intervention groups. The intervention starts in 11, 12, or 13. And so we randomize them to startup, and which allows everybody to get the intervention, but allows us to systematically study the first two years of intervention in a randomized way. And we had community lotteries where schools in an area came and drew out red, yellow, or green balls from a hat. Oh, we're starting. We're the pioneers. We're the, we're the second wave of consolidators. We're going to be able to take everything they failed and, and implement it even better in the third year. And so there are, there are community sensitive and culture sensitive ways of rationing uh, services to, to be able to, to learn this kind of stuff. Um, uh, while most of the kids speak, come in homes that, from homes that speak Swahili, there's about seven or other indigenous languages that are very common. The language of instruction in the Congo is French. And, and so the biggest thing you need to know is kids begin to go to school and learn stuff not knowing the language. Uh, that explains why they suck in reading, and this is profound suck. That's a technical term. Um, there, there are very high zero scores for a lot of the component parts on the early grades reading assessment and international assessment of reading achievement. Um, and there are, uh, um, where was I, zero scores by grade. Uh, you see an enduring uh, thing in the Congo that, that you see in many developing countries and you don't see in the United States, which is boys are doing better than girls in everything all the time. Uh, um, these are the zero scores by grade, which indicate that kids are learning over time, but at a rate that they, uh, they're not literate by the time they leave uh, uh, um, elementary school. And those were reading scores. These are the same stories for math scores. Um, 
there's a series of sensible risk things that predict teacher. Imagine being a teacher in this situation. Uh, one factoid about a teacher, they make on average uh, between 25 and 50 percent of what it takes to earn a two dollar a day per per person wage for their household. So they are earning at 25 to 50 percent of the international poverty line. But that 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 low. Uh, there are all sorts of other uh, complications related to it. A lot of sensible risk factors associated with children. And eventually, in, a, in about a year and a half, we're going to be able to test a similar kind of model in the Congo that I described to you in four hours, except, except that there are gigantic limitations, uh, overwhelming limitations to do this. Uh, imp implementation isn't going to go the way one expected. Uh, there are almost no studies to build on in the DRC. We had to make everything up. Um, the, the methodology requires an exquisite coordination between interventionists and researchers. Try doing that in a war zone. Um, in, and uh, we were flying the plane and building it at the same time. But other than that, very smooth. Um, <laughs> the, uh, there are strengths. Uh, we're going to learn a bunch of things from it. I'm not going to describe it now. I want to end um, with some thoughts about lessons so far. And this is lessons so far, not from just these two studies, but from 20 years of working on this kind of stuff. And uh, for school-based strategies to improve children's academic learning and their social-emotional learning and mental health, both in, in our country and in other countries, um, there are at least five things that I think we, we need to be increasingly moving toward as a field. And I know many of these things are strongly shared values and goals of the Bronfen Prenner Center for Translational Research. Um, there is the amount of faith-based training, I call it faith-based training and development, as opposed to evidence-based training and development, is still enormous. We live in a rarefied world. We accept the idea that this is good. That's not, even in our country, the majority uh, uh, value or opinion. We, we need to move from faith-based training and development to evidence-based. We live in a world of brands, nurse-family partnership, uh, success for all. Um, they're, they're brands. We've got to move from brands, which are important to market them, you know. Cheerios doesn't say, 14% uh, uh, protein, 25% carbohydrates, 1% one, one gram of salt. They don't, uh, that's all there, but they say Cheerios, okay? Well, Cheerios is fine, but Cheerios it doesn't tell you the nutritional value. We have to get to the active ingredients of interventions, and we are still very, very far away from really posing and rigorously identifying the essential, the, the active and then the essential ingredients of, of interventions. Um, efficacy trials get you tenure uh, if you're a high-risk person. Effectiveness, scalability, and sustainability trials get you early cardiac arrest. <laughs> we are biased toward publications. Uh, efficacy trials happen faster than effectiveness, scalability, and sustainability trials. Efficacy trials can be done with fewer resources more independently. I'm not against them, okay? But it's not enough. We have to go to these others. We have to go from programs to systems and policies. And I was joking last night, but it's half joke. Um, we have to go from translational research. That metaphor is a metaphor that came from bench science translation to the bedside in medicine. That assumes that knowledge begins at the bench and trickles down or radiates out eventually to service. Transformational research is explicitly bi-directional. It is uh, evidence-based programs and program-based evidence and, and, and doing things in a, in a truly bi-directional uh, way, which complicates things, but we need to do that. If we do that, um, oh, what, what, that so uh, this is kind of the, the larger aspirations for our subfield that I personally have, and I hope 
and I know many of those are shared with you, but some of them might be controversial, and I'd love you to kick my butt on some of them uh, in a second when I give you a chance to say anything. Um, there's all sorts of next, th this work is always evolving. So um, I think we have enough evidence now to advocate for s very significant policy change. So um, two years ago, uh, uh, Congressman Ryan in Ohio introduced the Academic and Social Emotional Learning Act. He's going to reintroduce it. We've got the Obama White House and the Department of Education interest in this kind of stuff. CASEL, uh, uh, the Consortium for uh, Academic Social Emotional Learning is the, is the driver of all that. But there's also very interesting and important science to continue. Stephanie Jones is leading a bunch of, uh, Stephanie has taken a whole bunch of things and developing a social, emotional, and cognitive understanding and regulation in education initiative, SECURE. And it is, it is uh, cobbling together the very best things and supercharging them in a way. There's a whole bunch of developments on the international side, including the need to create centers like the Bronfenbrenner Center to support work like this internationally. Uh, and whether it's in the United States or in other countries, uh, there needs to be international centers of excellence for transforming settings. Uh, with, and we're going to uh, work on that at NYU. Um, so what I've tried to do is tell you a story about uh, how, to, uh, how we're thinking about building a science for action. And uh, it begins with Yuri's kind of multi-level and, and dynamic vision of human development that is ambitiously transdisciplinary. It, that has to be it. It's attention to the basics, these obsessions of interventionists, of internal validity, external validity, causal mechanisms, heterogeneity of impact. It's effective collaborations across cultures uh, in many of its forms. It's accumulating and revising and replicating and systematically reviewing and meta-analysis, but all in a deeply theoretical, not in a, if there's no theory, nothing sticks. We need theory for facts to accrue to. Um, let's blow up these unuseful dichotomies. I emphasize nature and nurture, but objective and subjective. What makes, uh, I, you know, no uh, uh, behavioral economist now thinks that, uh, uh, something that goes on in the noodle isn't real. I mean, uh, um, uh, objective, subjective, schmudjective, uh, um, macro, micro. Um, but the, the one that I'm going to be spending a disproportionate amount of my time on over the next five or ten years or whatever, I don't believe in the Lord, so the Lord can't give me, uh, but whatever the, the motive, the, the moving, dynamic, dark force in the world uh, gives me, I'm going to be working on this global stuff. And, and the reason is because we've got to quit working just up in that quadrant and we've got to go elsewhere. I'm not, this is where the talk ends. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of other things the science of action requires and there's a lot of thoughts about Don Campbell's initial thoughts, which I will only submit you to if your question provokes that answer. <laughs> Thanks very much. Questions? We have time for a few questions. Is that oh, good? Rachel. So one thing I noticed on your slides about the, your work in the Congo, which I think is applicable in the U.S. context as well, is the need to sort of take the results and feed them back out to the community rapidly. But at the same time, you're still trying to learn. So can you talk a little bit about how you've dealt with that? Or uh, poorly um, <laughs> is the short answer. So how do you how do you uh, develop uh, take data and rapidly feed it back at, at, at the same time as do an objective study. Uh, a weightless control uh, uh, approach actually is somewhat helpful in that way. We don't think of it as the exact same. We'll, we'll, we're going we're gonna to assume it's the exact same intervention. But the real thing is got it, yes or no, get it, yes or no. So we, we did not, uh, we deliberately created a weightless control so that they could take things and keep improving them over time. There's, 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 there's challenges related to inference, but they're not nearly as big as the ethical dilemmas if you, if you don't do something like that. And I, I could talk more about that. The biggest challenge is in the Congo, there is no uh, s system of social or health statistics at population level. There's no system of education statistics at school level. Um, uh, attendance is taken in a 50-line ledger 
uh, that was used in the Belgian Congo. And if there's more kids in the classroom than there are 50, they just aren't noted in the ledger. The ledger sits in a room until a school inspector who has responsibility for 200 schools comes about once every three years and makes sure that you have attendance records. Uh, so the, the standard of the use of information for decision making is so low in the country and the infrastructure for it is so non-existent. I pled with IRC and USAID. I said, here's the most successful thing you do. Develop a national attendance and en enrollment and attendance system. Take all the money and do that. And then we'll do whatever else next. No. So, um, now the, so against that backdrop, nonetheless, uh, we have on our website the baseline reports we wrote uh, that document those, and, and USAID, the Ministry of Education, and the practitioners were very interested in baseline results. And they found uh, kids read a little better in some provinces than in others. Uh, children seem to be a little, doing a little better social emotionally than they, they appear to be doing academically. Um, there's a variety of things that we fed back from baseline that they were very interested in. They were really interested in the year two results. Um, we took a little bit of attention. We thought that having collected the data reliably in year one, we could pull back from New York on supervising that. Um, the year two data is so dirty um, that IRC is now n not in contract compliance with USAID because we refuse to analyze the dirty data until it's clean and it's, and it's off schedule. So, um, and uh, you know, I was prepared to have them fire me and they twisted my arm hard and I said, no. Nope. And they said, well, can you give us the data? And I said, as long as I can write a paragraph that says why you shouldn't believe what you're gonna do with it, yes. And they said, okay. So they are literally into contract compliance with USAID. So, um, you've opened a can of worms. Uh, may we have a drink later or two, and I'll, I'll tell you more. It's an enormously important issue. It's an enormously important issue. Larry, well, it's, it's interesting that the, the social emotional learning interventions that you, that you talk about are, and are reviewed are, are mainly universal interventions for the most part. Yep. All, all of them. Could you just? Talk a little bit about the wisdom and from a, both a scientific and a policy perspective of universal versus targeted interventions. Because we make certain assumptions about what those universal interventions will do in a school population. Well, it, it's, it's not like I think that um, children in the schools we're working with wouldn't benefit from individual tutoring if it was efficacious tutoring. Uh, and that those shouldn't be differentially given to kids. So um, I want to begin by saying that they're universal, not because I don't think the targeted interventions aren't potentially valuable. Um, it is to say that um, until we do the universal interventions, um, I'm, I personally believe more that the universal interventions do two things. They uh, are more likely to be able to be scaled at cost in a way that, and as, it's, as you see, this one has differential effects for the most behaviorally at risk, and it costs less than a targeted intervention. The, 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 the four R's cost, uh, I don't know how many people know the difference between price and cost. Uh, the price of four R's is a, somewhere between one and $200 a kid a year. The, uh, the cost is more than that because you're, it's offsetting time and things like that. But, um, there is no targeted intervention that could affect 8% of the kids for that price. You take the combined price for the universal intervention, it's about $1,000 or $1,200 per 8% of the population. You then get all those other positive effects for everybody. So, so I'm, I'm going to try to wring out what I can from universal interventions and make sure that they're differentially impactful for the most at-risk kids before I spend a lot of time on, on the targeted interventions myself. Um, that's not, that's a taste preference. 
I, I, uh, I hope that, uh, I was arguing with you this morning, the very best thing would be to combine setting level interventions with targeted uh, individual uh, level interventions and, and to combine those, I think. There's plenty of those. There's less work on the setting level, uh, except in a couple of domains, uh, uh, like social emotional learning. So, Gary. One of the uh, dimensions on one of your tables that I found really interesting was that one way to categorize a lot of this work is we're either trying to reduce risks or we're trying to create buffers. Mm -hmm. And I'd be interested in your thoughts about why the American preoccupation with buffering and almost a total ignore, ignorance of changing risks. Um, I mean, resilience is a huge business, and resilience is all about buffering. It's not about changing risks. No, I agree with you. Well, um, American character and social structure is the short answer. Uh, Pull yourself uh, up by your boots. I, I think it's consistent with the Horatio Algeri. I mean, the, the, you know, it transforms in several ways. But we want good news. You know, we we, we want to. Uh, you know, we we get bad news. Um, but I also think that the the risks, um, the relationship between structural determinants or social determinants of risk, uh, and uh, and change strategies, I think, is the biggest obstacle. It's very very hard. It, it, but there's no doubt that behavioral risk affects health. There's no doubt that structural risk affects behavioral risk. Okay. And, and if you back up in the risk change, you wind up with structure. And Americans don't really want to mess with structure. I mean, I, I, so that, that's, and that's more informed by the poverty work that I do than the education work that I do. And, and uh, uh, but you ask a great question, and that's a skimpy uh, answer. Again, I do best with long answers in the evening with wine. <laughs> the other thing that I think is interesting about that, when you actually look at the data, there's, there's enough research now where you can compare risks to resilience. It's a very consistent conclusion. The risks always out for there. So in other words, if you look at how much of the variance you can explain, the risk completely And actually we, yeah, yeah, and it, it yeah. even we don't yet really have a shared conceptual and statistical set of definitions for risk and resilience. So the same factor can be a promotive factor if it has a direct effect, and a resilience factor if it has a buffering or moderating effect. And people think that whether it's promotive or uh, resilient is entailed in the variable. It's not. It's in, entailed in the functional relationship between the variable and the outcome. And same with risk. And, and so um, uh, the whole literature gets drawn on in a, in a weird way. Now, um, there's a group of uh, doctoral students who at SRCD uh, are doing a, a poster symposium on risk outcome relations in the Congo and in South Africa, uh, the other place I do a lot of work. And, and they would die and go to heaven if you went by their poster. So, so to, and they'll, they'll, help, they'll talk to you about this a lot more. So they, they probably wouldn't die. But, but they would be very excited to talk to Gary Evans about that. So. Sir. Um, at the beginning of the talk, you were talking about social emotional learning and how, and it was interesting talking about how it improves education. Most Hold on for one second. When the door closes and your voice goes, use your outside voice. Sorry. Let me start projecting. Um, so, most people. Sorry. That's okay, man. Um, At the beginning of the talk. about how it's easier to get it as a marginal cost because most people don't think of the value that it adds. One of the other things that makes me think of is things like scientific learning, metacognitive skills, empirical reasoning. Um, so I would be very interested to hear the stuff you have on Donald Campbell. Um, and also ties in the things you were saying about how most people don't value evidence-based practice as much as they should. And that's one of the other kind of skills and mindsets that it seems like would be really beneficial but most people don't connect to. I didn't pay him, but <laughs> I, I am grateful. Um, Don emphasizes that an experimenting society is going to be an active society preferring exploratory innovation to inaction. 
I actually think that that is one of the fundamental th things. We uh, um, partially successful or even failed experiments are preferable to inaction. That's an ethical and epistemological stance of Don's, and I share it. A scientific society uh, 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 is uh, an experimenting society is a scientific society willing to change once advocated theories uh, don't, aren't supported by the evidence. Um, uh, the one I like most is a society, uh, an experimenting society is a society committed to means idealism as well as ends idealism. In the modern view of science, the process of experimenting and proving will be expected to continue indefinitely without reaching the asymptote of perfection. Okay? So if we're a little better, God bless us and keep going and don't rest on your laurels and don't quit. The don't rest on your laurels and don't quit and don't never start uh, is, and, and um, the, uh, the, the thing I'm most concerned about is this. He believed back then there are shared aspects of political processes that work against of the emergence of this kind of society. Because there's a bunch of things about egalitarian and participatory and other things that are part of an experimenting society and which may in the long run preclude it. And we've been through 25 years of wars about this. So those of you who didn't read Al Gore's book, The Assault on Reason, which is what he did in his depressed 50 extra pound post uh, uh, 2000 election period. He, he wrote a diatribe against uh, um, where the Bush administration was around uh, the use and suppression of evidence. Um, these are fairly high stakes issues and we should not think that we are just uh, technical people and we also shouldn't think that we're just working at the interface of science and policy and practice. What we want to do involves a vision of society that's substantially different than some dominant visions. And, and in that way, this work is uh, upsetting. Um, you know, you, uh but your idea of an experimenting society... Right Don now, Campbell's idea, yeah, no, which I endorse. Excuse me, um, <laughs> your highlighting of it, uh, you know, it leads me to a thought and to a question. Um, as you know, you know, you're in the land-grant side of the university. And, and happy to be here. Well, you know, but really you're talking about, in a way, what agricultural experiment stations were. And the reason why they were so effective, at least to my question, is they could compare two farmers' fields and someone using a different level of, of, of let's say, irrigation or seeds uh, had better crops and the other farmers changed over. Is Where the term sampling frame came from. Well, yeah, but the problem I see with the kind of work you do and that we do is that our results are often too puny. Uh, you know, they're never quite sufficient. A slightly higher test score, a slightly better grade average is never enough to make school B say, Boy, you know, um, the equivalent of, boy, I could increase my crop yield by 30% by doing something relatively simple. Um, and I don't know how we get there, how to get people... Well, the analogy is a false one because they don't try to grow those in deserts. Uh, I can get you those effect sizes if I get to pick the contexts that optimize them. That's not where the work is. Okay, and, and so I agree with you that our effect sizes are puny. I agree with you that we need to double, triple, quadruple them, at least. I believe we can, but it will require an understanding of the relationship between interventions and contexts that uh, elude us yet. And it is the equivalent of doing those kinds of experiments and expecting the same yields in very hostile climates. So they're, they're manipulating a single thing and getting those kinds of yields. But they're doing it in Iowa and, you know, in the cornfields of Illinois. That's not, so that's where the analogy doesn't work, even though your larger point, I couldn't agree with you more, but let's, let's not hold, 
you, you want to make, leave me depressed too. I, I began with depression. I thought I was beginning with kind of a feisty optimism. Um, but uh, you, you really want to just depress us all, man. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm teasing. That's what associate deans do. That's what associate deans do. There you go. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.